So let's talk a little bit in principle about how we approach patients with relapsed and refractory disease. And I'll, I'll, I'll sort of start off the discussion by saying let's segment it into two pieces. Patients with early relapse, sort of one to three prior lines of therapy, and patients with refractory relapse, probably greater than three, or what we now call the quad refractory patients. Um, are your approaches different? Do you use genetics? Do you use, what are the factors you use to make decisions on how to treat a patient who's relapsed, let's say after a transplant? Nooper? So I think it's important to try and distinguish between is this just a biochemical relapse where the numbers are just going up and is this a standard risk patient? And these things really come into play when you're talking about relapse disease. And so that if I have somebody who on maintenance lenalidomide, for example, and the M protein goes from 0.3 to 0.6, am I gonna jump into treatment? Probably not, especially in a standard risk patient. I think in a patient with high risk features where you are gonna worry about a bad outcome where you are going to worry about uh, organ dysfunction and so on and so forth, you want to go in and start treating early. So I think you need to make that distinction. The other piece where you have to make a distinction is what have they had previously and what are they relapsing off of. And once you make those distinctions, then you can come up with different treatment uh, combinations. Um, the good news again, uh, and we are very fortunate at this meeting, Sagar, where we're going to hear about a lot of good, new, interesting data uh, coming out tomorrow. So we have choices. And this is again where we take into account the morbidities associated with that patient presenting, the kind of myeloma and the kind of relapse that the patient is having in coming up with a recipe for that patient. Okay. So I don't think one size fits all. You just have to pick and choose. Okay, so Raphael, half a country away from Massachusetts. <laughs> do, you, do you disagree or agree? Okay, let me check the weather in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do, so we're I doing do. pretty well right now. We had a horrible winter, but we are fine. Dial back three months. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I agree with everything Nopor said. Of course, previous agents, depth of um, and you know duration of, of previous regimens is very important. Current status of the patient, uh, tolerability, renal function, all of those things really play a very important role. I would say this is probably one of the, the, the hardest things in myeloma is we all know what drugs we have available, but how do we position them for mm -hmm. a patient who's mm -hmm. experiencing a relapse? And then also the, the delta of the relapse, whether it's a biochemical relapse versus a very aggressive relapse, all of those would, would come into play. I think based on what, what Maury said before, uh, one of the things that it's important to consider in myeloma is that previously used drugs can be effective again because of this notion of the subclones. So, so you have a patient who gets induction, gets a transplant, goes to MRD, when the disease comes up, we don't know what the subclone composition is as opposed to when the patient first started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But empirically, we know that some of those patients will respond again to the same drug. So I think uh, we have a lot of opportunities there. Okay. Jayton, when do you think about retreating versus class switching? Uh, or do you even think about it? Do you just know what you're going to do and just go? <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think it's important because there's, you know, historically we had limited options for patients. And so they need to want to... Um, try and wait and try and sequence them. And I think what we're learning now that we have a lot more drugs, and mm -hmm. so I think that's less of an issue. We're also learning about clonal heterogeneity and trying to make sure that we use multi-drugs combinations up front or earlier. Mm -hmm. And we've seen consistently now in newly diagnosed as well as in early lines of therapy that uh, combination therapies do matter. Mm -hmm. And so um, and we'll talk about the Aspire data in a little bit, and we're seeing some unprecedented PFSs there. But I think what we're seeing is that consistently across myeloma, across oncology, when you use your good therapies earlier, patients do better. And so I think that's an important principle that we have to continue. Now, obviously there's gonna be subsets of patients that may not need triplet therapy, but I think the earlier that you use your good therapies, um, will improve the outcome. So well, as Maury shakes his head, let me, <laughs> let, me, let me throw up the paradigm. Perhaps early relapse should be treated like newly diagnosed. And is, is that, are we ready to make that kind of a shift? Maury, tell me so now. I, I focus a lot on velocity of relapse. It's something we don't do very well as a group, defining the rate at which the M protein is rising. And people who have high velocity relapse will need immediate therapy, but there are patients who have reappearance of an M protein from CR and are otherwise asymptomatic, but the tumor mass is still very, very low and we didn't eradicate it the first time around. And in those patients who have a low velocity relapse, for which I'm very enamored with the immunoglobin free light chain assay, I use that a lot. 
as a leading indicator of mm -hmm. progression in patients with plateau is why there's a, for me, a real difference between progression-free survival and time to next therapy. Right. Because there are patients who I'm very comfortable observing with uh, low velocity relapse before I finally intervene. Yeah, the challenge I have with interpreting time to next therapy is that in some centers, it, time to next therapy may be dependent on whether you've got the trial ready to go, right? So it may vary if people have met criteria for relapse. I'm not saying it's a validated <laughs> endpoint because it is highly subjective right. as to when right. you step in. But I just think it's fair to recognize that there can be a difference and that the mere fact of progression right. doesn't automatically right. or necessarily trigger a need for intervention. Right. And I agree. I think there's some data from Blade that showed that patients who relapse, um, some of those patients with a very slow relapse will be two to three years before actually they have true progression, or they'll just have a rise in their protein from 0.1 to 0.5 and then plateau out and stay there for a long period of time. So there are subsets of patients that slow relapse and then plateau out again. Um, and so I agree with that, but I say once you do have active progression that needs systemic therapy, then I think using combination therapies is important for those patients who can tolerate it. Okay. So, Heather, um, Jayton brought up the idea of combinations and relapse. Doublets, combinations, how do, how do you think through it? And then I think the ASPIRE data is, is, um, is really very dr dramatically shows the, that uh, with the combination of carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, that progression-free survival can be equivalent to transplant in the upfront setting um, without maintenance. So mm -hmm. those are remarkable kind of data points that have been described mm -hmm. with, with um, triplet combinations. The one thing that the the thing that we have to be cognizant of is the schedule mm -hmm. and the quality of life issues because now we're now we have an explosion of new drugs mm -hmm. and we, we don't know how to use them because we, we haven't done the the sequencing versus combination right. randomized trials and so we have all of these drugs some patients who have this low low burden of progression now you're going to subject them to um, treatment at six days a month mm -hmm. um, and when you live in New York City where <laughs> parking <laughs> is costly right 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 um, and even waiting for the parking lot mm -hmm. is 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 a, it's a day affair mm -hmm. um, it, it, it makes a big difference so while the data is remarkable we have to really think of the context in which we're treating patients with relapse disease the other thing I also say is that Patients who are under care of, uh, under the care of a physician, shouldn't get into trouble. Um, while there are some patients who explode in the relapse setting, particularly um, with multiple relapses, um, patients who are on their first or second relapse, we should be able to prevent end organ damage mm -hmm. because we we should be following these patients. Um, where, where patients shouldn't get into trouble. So, so we often have to make these very difficult decisions of time to next, uh, of when, mm -hmm. to, when to start therapy. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, these patients are enjoying a, a great quality of life on maintenance lenalidomide, or if you're in Arizona, playing golf, not on maintenance <laughs> in, in some cases, and then when to pull the trigger, and then what to do with, with um, the drugs that are available. Maury? First of all, I think you made a very powerful argument to get your care in New Jersey, first of all. <laughs> uh, but the one thing that I wrestle with that I really would like to hear from everyone on the panel is, so I've got a patient who's been on maintenance lenalidomide 10, and they're progressing, and they're saying, well, maybe I should go to 25. That, or I have a few high-risk patients getting bortezomib every other week, and they're starting to show progression. They're saying, well, maybe I should go to once a week or twice a week. I have no idea how to answer those patients. I'm just kind of wondering what the other panelists are doing. Yeah. For Lynn, I'll tell you our experience. When, you, when you're progressing on 10 and you go up to 25, I have not found it to be more effective. Okay. For tezomib, I've seen, the, I've seen it work. I have to agree. And actually, we are doing a trial called the Lynn Intensification Trial. Oh, that's um, great where patients who are relapse, first relapse on lenalidomide maintenance, mm -hmm. we have increased the dose to 25, not 
not adding bortez, uh, not adding uh, dexamethasone, and then allowing steroids to be uh, incorporated. And we're studying it, but uh, it's it's not. It's not uh, straightforward. I mean, kudos to you. That's a fundamental question. I think we need to get smarter about this thing. Probably should have in the iPhone Watch a program <laughs> that says if you're on Len 10, you're going to 25. If you would agree, of course. There's a repository where we know this data. I don't know the, the answer to those questions. And of course, patients um, bank some of the decision-making process based on how we react to that mm -hmm. question. They say, well, doctor, if I'm a 10, probably I'll do five, fine when I'm a 25. I've seen few, but more likely than not, it's not something that is successful with lenalidomide. Right. I haven't used a lot of the of the biweekly uh, bortezomib, yeah, but I think those are just fundamental questions. And the reason I say that is because then if you have data, for instance, for elotuzumab, I mean, are, what are you going to do when you have a maintenance LEN patient show progression? Is that the person who should be getting elotuzumab at 25 of LEN? And that's, a, that's an important question. Okay. And the one other thing you have to consider is patients on lenalidomide maintenance for a prolonged amount of time may not have the the counts to be able mm -hmm. to add mm -hmm. lenalidomide 25 milligrams. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So let me ask this then. Um, we talked about PFS, the data from the ASPIRE trial. Um, how are we going to compare across different large phase three trials? Because we know there are many either just coming out or soon to come out in terms of large phase three trials. And there may be subtle differences in terms of who was enrolled in those patients, what the risk profile was for those patients. Um, how are we going to think about PFS? Is PFS the best measure? Is hazard ratio the best measure? Is area under the curve the best measure? How, how do we put these together to try and make rational decisions? So, you know, I don't think one can look at just PFS. And I do think looking at, especially if you're doing cross-trial comparisons, you are going to need to look at uh, the hazard ratio. You are going to need to look at the area under the curve, which is going to give us a better sense when we are comparing two completely different trials. It will give us a better sense of how effective these compounds are. Okay. Jayden, Maury, you want to? Well, I, I, I certainly agree that hazard ratio is a much better measure than progression-free survival, and area under the curve, for that matter, which we don't talk about much, is a much better measure. But I don't think that helps us with cross-trial comparisons, because there's still so much heterogeneity in the myeloma population accrued that across trials that one had a hazard ratio of 0.8 and one was 0.65, I'd be pretty nervous about it, just because we see such different populations for referral.